and welcome to a new video series in the Apache CloudStack YouTube channel, CloudStack Integrations. Apache CloudStack is a multi-hypervisor, multi-tenant, high availability cloud management system. And in these videos, we will present a range of technologies with which CloudStack has integrations and which can become part of your technology stack. So, hello everyone. Today we are here with Giles Harrett, who is uh, a PMC member of Apache CloudStack and chairman of the CloudStack European Group. And we have a special guest from Limbit, Philip Reisner, who is the CEO of Limbit. So, I'm Philip Reisner. I'm one of the founders of, of Limbit, uh, and we founded like 20 years ago. And uh, I'm CEO of Limbit, but I need to add, I'm a very technical CEO. So from time to time, I managed to hack on the code for a few weeks, uh, the hours. <laughs> Let's say also a warm welcome to Giles. Thank you, Vet. Nice to be here today. Nice to have you here for this discussion on storage and the integration of CloudStack and Limbit. Would you like to present yourself with a few words? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I think, as you said in the intro, Vet, I'm uh, I'm a PMC member of the Apache CloudStack project. Have been for eight years. I'm also chairman of the CloudStack European User Group uh, and uh, do a lot of work ar around the community on, on that side. Not as not as technical these days as Philippe is, uh, although I describe myself as a recovering software engineer. It's been a long time since I've, I've written a line of code, but I keep threatening to, to do so. Sooner or later, I'm going to get around to it. Uh, when I'm not working in the community, I'm, I'm CEO of Shape Blue, uh, which is the CloudStack company who provides services around Apache CloudStack. So we will try to keep this conversation not very technical and to focus more on the business perspective of the storage integrations of CloudStack. So CloudStack as a technology is integrated with a bunch of other technologies. And that's actually giving the freedom to the companies to make their own decision of which technology stack to use. Can you tell us a little bit more about the flexibility which CloudStack is providing in this direction? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, Cloud, CloudStack is, a, is an orchestration platform, right? It's, its job is to orchestrate and automate other technologies, right? Whether they're hypervisors, storage platforms like Limbits, uh, and networking components. So really the success of CloudStack is based on the fact it can orchestrate as many things as possible. Uh, now, we've sort of as a community settled into an approach, which is first of all, keeping CloudStack's core scope quite narrow. Uh, and the logic there is what we don't want to do is to branch into too many things, which then taking hypervisors for as, as an example, if we go down the route of supporting everything that a particular hypervisor does, we're never going to be able to su support a common feature set across all of those hypervisors. And to a certain extent, ditto storage. So, you know, one of one of the things with CloudStack is for either its primary or secondary storage, it can use anything that, that presents NFS, right? And, and we're quite proud that you can use any storage. Where it gets interesting is if people want to explicitly exploit some of the more advanced functionality in those platforms, whether they're hypervisors, whether they're, they're storage platforms, then we need deeper integration. Uh, and that's, I'm not sure, that's one of the things we're gonna be talking about today. We, ha we have a subset of vendors where the community or those vendors have seen demand from their customers to have some of their smart features exploited through through CloudStack. Does, does that answer your question, Yvette? I think yes, and it goes uh, in all the details which we need. Actually, when we talk for storage, we all know that uh, choosing a storage technology is crucial for the companies who are building infrastructure as a service or any type of cloud. And Philip is the storage expert here. So Philip, can you give us a little bit more information on what should companies have in mind when they're making their choice for a suitable storage platform? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Um, I would say different different companies approach that with different policies in mind. Um, you know, when when we look at at organizations that are in cloud providers, IAS cloud providers, 
Um, I think they are under high pressure when it when it comes to the prices on the market. So my impression is they are mainly driven by getting the price low. Um, when I look at the enterprise customers, um, they seem to uh, be driven by other motivations, right? They're, they're like, let's say the, um, yeah. <laughs> the word is because it does, isn't coming to mind. <laughs> they well, let's say the the reputation of of the companies providing all the parts in the stack um, has their another importance than when it comes to these IAS providers. So quite quite different different aspects driving the different companies. So one of the factors which you think uh, companies should have in mind is actually the price for storage, which totally makes sense. Uh, but Jas and Philip, what other factors do you think are crucial when selecting the storage technology? Yeah, um, performance is a very important factor and performance has these two uh, aspects. One is the raw throughput, one is the latency. Um, and then is it, is it suitable to be used in a hyper-converged way? And that has impact on the price and on performance. And then, yeah, talking about performance is a, a huge topic, right? There are, there's read performance, write performance, then it comes down to if, it's, if the workload is sequential or full, full random. So, there is a lot of many things to consider. Yeah, and I, I think just to add to that, Yvette, I think, you know, rolling back a few years ago, there was this arguably quite dumb conversation all the time, just price per gigabyte, price pence per gigabyte or dollar per gigabyte or, or, or what have you. And, you know, when we were advising a lot of our customers at the time around storage uh, platforms, it, it was, guys, you, you can't just look at that simple metric because, you know, one of the big things we're obsessed about is scalability. So people are designing these environments, particularly service providers, and they want to be able to build it small because they don't want to run a, you know, inflated cost base from, from, from the get-go, but they need it to be able to scale very, very quickly if, if, if you know, if they get a lot of traction in the market. So the ability of that uh, of that platform to scale whilst maintaining a predictable price point is really important. And often, you know, in a traditional procurement process, they go through and they're just obsessed by this price per, per gigabyte from the outset. What it doesn't reflect is how scalable that platform's going to be uh, in the future. And and then the other thing is is you know the ability with different platforms, you know, performance whether it's just IOPS or, or being able to do clever pieces of automation through some more enhanced integration with, with, with CloudStack is very important because if that allows an organization to deliver services uh, that they couldn't deliver without that integration, that has to all be taken into account. So, you know, I think we need to move on from, you know, just that price per, per gigabyte as the initial, uh, as, as, as the dominant thing here, right? So if we need to uh, summarize, the three key factors are actually the performance, the scalability, and the price. That's what companies should have in mind on top of their mind, actually. Yeah, and I would throw functionality in there as well, maybe. And talking from functionalities, uh, Philip, can you share a little bit more with us about which functionalities are must-haves when you choose a storage solution and which functionalities are like the cherry in the cake so companies should also search for them? <laughs> yeah, uh, very wide question. So that, that will widely vary, vary between the different customers or companies we look at. You know, the, the, the basic requirement, it needs to store data and you need to be able to read it back. Then on, on top of that comes maybe thin provisioning. Then you want to keep the data if something fails. So then we come to high availability. Um, then maybe you need more disaster reliance. So you need to replicate the data over longer distances. 
Um, and when, when we talk about this replication between data centers, it might be that you uh, need to federate uh, different uh, different centers of operation together. Um, so add tons of features. And then in, in, in the area of storage also has contact points with, with backup. So has the storage platform capabilities to support your backup operation, maybe even built in backup capabilities. So, and yeah, quite, quite different for different companies, what they require of all these features. We see that CloudStack is adopted by more and more enterprises. And I suppose that's also the same situation with Limbit. Uh, and if you need to make a comparison between what is the checklist of uh, SMEs and enterprises, is there any difference between the needs in terms of storage capabilities? Yeah, S SMEs will you know, be satisfied with a smaller <laughs> basket of the features. Um, and the enterprises, they, they need it all, um, especially then the, what is now called federation, so that you have your operation going in multiple um, data centers, uh, which can operate independently, but you can uh, select uh, volumes to be replicated between those. And then there are different modes of replication, synchronous, asynchronous, and, and down to snapshot shipping in case your edge locations are on, on limited uh, uh, network bandwidth. And as you're communicating also with many enterprises in terms of their cloud management platform, so would you like to add some specific requirements in terms of cloud management? Yeah, well, <laughs> In a way, the answer to that event is, is not the answer you want, because one, one thing we, we do see in the enterprise space with, with, with CloudStack as a cloud management platform is that there's a massive amount of inertia around the storage platform, right? which is something I was going to mention earlier. So, you know, often from an enterprise perspective, we're going to help them deploy an orchestration layer but that doesn't necessarily mean, because this is not a greenfield infrastructure build, that doesn't mean they're going to, to start changing their storage. And they might have lots of aspirations about things they could do with a different storage platform, but we shouldn't underestimate that inertia. And that inertia is around not just about an organization getting sort of stuck with a particular vendor, but it's about the skills around that technology. It's around that, that legacy knowledge, the comfort, the commercial relationships they've got. And I think that's a really interesting point because, you know, we look at all these questions you ask about, you know, why are people choosing storage platforms and everything? I'd love to know what the percentage is where the incumbent storage platform remains in place, but it's really high, right? Because even with great features, it's very difficult to disrupt that in, in especially especially in an enterprise environment. Sorry, I'm, I'm going slightly off piste there, but uh, that's that I think is quite an important factor, particularly for you know modern storage vendors like Limbit. Is about how do you disrupt that that sort of legacy, if you like. And when you mention legacy technologies, uh, previously storage was separated into legacy SaaS storage and the new age software defined storage. What would you say, is this still relevant or the software defined storage is like the new normal for the companies? From my view, it's becoming the new normal, uh, but I haven't got any analysis in front of me in here, but I, I would guess a massive percentage of enterprise storage out there is still hardware-based storage solutions, not software-defined. Uh, so that that will that will come with time. Uh, Philip, would be interested to hear what you you your view on that is. Yeah, I mean, my my impression on that is heavily biased because <laughs> with Linbit we we offer a software-defined storage, so we we see the people uh, who are ready to switch 
or who are willing to go to software defined storage. So I don't see the other, the other camp, right? Um, but I can say my camp is growing. <laughs> Which are the typical problems which companies are facing when they're making their choice for a storage technology and how a good storage solution can help them resolve the everyday challenges? Um, yeah, so, so the challenges that some of our customers are, are trying to solve is on the one hand, uh, those who want to escape their storage platform where they have uh, where they have been and they are feeling like being held hostage there uh, when the prices for drives get into astronomic uh, areas after three years or four. Um, the, the, other, the other challenge uh, some of them need to solve is if, if they were swamped into, into software defined storage, let's say in the first wave, and now they realize, oh, we need a little bit more performance. And we also often talk to these guys um, and see what we can do, what we can solve there. Because I would say a few years back, software defined storage was, was like a synonym for slow. And this is no longer the case. <laughs> Would you like to add something, Giles? Yeah, no, I, I, th I think I, I agree with uh, Philippe there. I mean, again, not just across storage, across so many other areas, we see things becoming software defined is a, a natural decoupling of the of, of the hardware from from the intelligence in the software. And, and I think that that's that's a logical thing we're going to see across storage, across networking, across all, all sorts of, of other areas. Of course, it does break a, a commercial model that's well established, right, which is I've built some clever software and I'm going to sell you a very expensive piece of uh, hardware to, to run it. And you have to buy that hardware from me. So th there's going to be resistance in, in the market. But I think, you know, it's a natural evolution here in, in the storage industry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to add here, although we call it a hardware solution in the storage market, it is software. It's just called firmware, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's it's when 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 I look at it from a very high altitude, I would say we we just change from calling it firmware to software. I will go back to something which you mentioned earlier, Philip, and that's for the vendor independence. So companies, they really have diverse needs uh, and uh, if they need to select a solution for block, object, and file, would you recommend them to choose a single provider who is offering the three solutions or to select like different providers for the different types of storage? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, again, in uh, here, my answer will be a bit biased uh, because Linbit does block storage only. And uh, my, my take on that is have one solution for block, one for file and one for uh, object because then you, you get it from someone who understands what he's doing. So, um, my feeling is that if you have a storage system that provides all three of those, you, you get the, the, the suboptimal for each of those. Um, yeah, so my, my advice, three separated systems. What's your experience, Giles, here? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't feel strongly. If, again, from from experience, I mean, you know, if we unravel this file and object, are really just interfaces into un underlying storage, right? They're 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 routes to market for 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 storage vendors. And you know, what we see with you know a lot of our customers is what they're actually using for the the, the block storage is, is is quite separated from what they're then using to provide an object storage layer on top of that. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't be choosing a storage platform specifically because it ticked boxes of doing 
uh, tick the box of doing object storage. Uh, it wouldn't wouldn't be a, a big factor in, in in my decision when choosing storage. Philip, can you tell us a little bit more about Limbit and what you are offering to the market? How are you solving the problems with speed uh, and reliability for your customers? Yeah, maybe let me add a few sentences who Limbit is. So with Limbit, we started in the year 2000. In the very early, early days, it was like a generic consulting company for Linux. Then we turned to high availability and now we arrived in storage. And in part for high availability, we already had this uh, replication part there. And now with storage, that means that we have um, integrations into more orchestrators. Um, so this the Limpid SDS is a generic uh, SDS. It's not tied to a single orchestrator. So it's available to CloudStack and also to other players in the ecosystem. Um, where does the performance come from? Uh, our whole data path is uh, built as Linux kernel modules. And so we can do a number of optimizations that are not possible in, when it is built as user space applications. And so that's the data path. And that is combined with a control path that is of course implemented in user space. And here comes this, this scalability aspect. So, so right now, the biggest uh, cluster we have in operation it spans about 650 uh, uh, nodes. And from the performance data we see from this installation, we are pretty sure that it will also work with a thousand or 2000 nodes. And what type of customers are using Cleanbit? Can you mention a few companies? Um, it's infrastructure as a service cloud providers um, to, to enterprises. Um, and yeah, all, all over the board. <laughs> And and it down to 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 SMEs, um, SMEs might look uh, might use it for you know a th three node virtualization cluster where they enjoy that the storage is built in, so they have a hyper converged system. And on the other end, at the big installation at cloud providers, uh, we see both models. We see hyper converged deployments. Uh, Again, because they optimize for cost. Uh, I also see uh, uh, deployments where storage and compute nodes are clearly separated uh, due to decisions there. In the CloudStack community, we believe that using open source technology is a key factor so that companies can stay competitive on the market. And as far as we know, Limbit is also offering an open source solution. Why did you decide to do this? <laughs> yeah, that, that's like, let's say, our company DNA. So um, nearly everything we do is open source, nearly. We have small bits of proprietary add-ons. So in the, in the context of the Limbit SDS, uh, it is a dedicated GUI. So that's proprietary, that's only for our customers, but everything else, the data path, the control path, everything is open source. And the, the business model is very similar to let's say Red Hat's business model. So we sell support subscriptions that enables our customers to use the software in a very convenient way Right, they get access to YAM repositories and uh, um, apt repositories, um, or or operators and and whatever these things are called. So we make it for them convenient as possible. Um, but at the same time, every line we we commit is immediately available on the public uh, um, Git repository, and we definitely have open source users. So we have also the, the open source community that 
doesn't pay, but that's fine. I think that's very similar to to shape blue, right? Yeah, I mean, we 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 provide services around an established open source project. So rather, I suppose the only difference there is, Philippe, is you know this is your technology that you've then open sourced. Uh, we 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 are just providing services around an existing project. But yeah, the the commercial model is is very much the same. It's that Red Hat style model in terms of you know a customer wanting some convenience and some peace of mind around the, the, the technology and wanting that vendor wrapper around it. But at the core of it, it's free and open source. One question to both of you, what are the um, key benefits which open source technologies are bringing to the companies? How they are actually making them more competitive? I, I, I'm sorry for that, I jump in, but what one, what the probably the main thing for me is the the or, organic nature of things that are open source because anybody can contribute right um, and what we've seen particularly in our space which went crazy a few years ago because everybody was trying to build IaaS solutions vendors rushing in with their own uh, technologies. And then those vendors quickly changing direction in their roadmap and leaving customers sort of high and dry because, you know, they they predicted a roadmap was going to go one direction and then the vendor's gone in a completely different direction. So that long term reliability, I think you will only ever get from open source because it's being contributed on by lots of different people representing lots of different views and lots of different use cases. Uh, whereas proprietary is always going to be what is most commercially important for the vendor, right? Uh, and if that happens to align with what you want as a customer, that's great. If it doesn't, then you're going to be in trouble down the line. So that's that's the, probably the single biggest thing for me. I, I, I want to add here, for me, open source is like the new normal. Um, and to just look at the stacks people are running in the data centers, right? Mm -hmm. There's Linux operating system, open source, uh, cloud stack on top of it, open source. Uh, why should you then just make this one part, let's say the storage software, a proprietary software in this whole mm -hmm. thing, uh, which cripples all the vendors ability to uh, uh, drill down and find something mm -hmm. uh, if necessary. So I think in a certain space, open source is the new normal and you shoot yourself in the foot if you don't uh, yeah. participate that. Uh, another interesting thought was, I heard that from Mark Shuttleworth. He said, you know, look at all the, all the unicorn startups. Uh, they're all building completely on open source. If they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to, to scale their businesses in as quickly as they do yeah and and not 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 just financially either as well right it's not just that 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 vendors you know want to want to charge people money it's just in terms of agility in terms of speed to be able to adopt software that's so much faster when you you can go to github and have the software running in 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 five minutes instead of having to phone people and get evaluation copies and that sort of stuff. So I agree with you, Philippe. It's, 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 the, it's absolutely the new norm. And what was quite interesting last week, uh, uh, there was a, over in the US, there was a Senate hearing about the recent, uh, I don't know if you saw it, the, the Log4J uh, vulnerability. And uh, the ASF secretary had to, had to turn up and, and, and give, give evidence in front of that committee. But there was a general conception, even amongst those sort of government people there, that you know we really rely on open source. This is the new normal, and we can't just moan that open source might have some vulnerabilities. Now we we've got to get engaged. As you know, this was the U.S. government talking. We've got to get engaged with open source because we're using everything depends on it. Uh, so I think yeah, you're right. It's the new normal. So we discussed what is the new standard, but let's also focus a bit more on the future. What is the future of the storage technologies? What kind of new features or new capabilities will be presented soon on the market? Um, so what what we what what keeps me awake at night currently is 
is um, integration with with public cloud providers. So that that is what we as storage vendors need to run after. Um, so let's say my my roadmap contains that I make uh, Linbit SDS compatible with the, let's say five or 10 uh, most prominent uh, cloud providers out there, public cloud providers, which allows then the customers to build these systems where they can easily move the workloads between them. So it's in a way working against their vendor lock-in ideas, but this is what the users need. Jeff, any observations? Yeah, I mean, I, si similar to just from speaking to people we work with, I, I, I see a movement in that direction, that sort of concept of federation of storage anywhere, uh, where organizations aren't having to worry about necessarily where that underlying infrastructure is. They've just got an endpoint, and it may well be their infrastructure. It might be some some storage they're buying in from from big public from the hyperscalers or from 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 other people and i see that sort of you know removing the silos around storage as something we're going to see over the next few years and at the end of this conversation about storage uh, is the cloud stack community planning on new storage integrations or improvements in the existing ones I mean, there's always work going on. Uh, if I mean, we've got a lot of uh, managed storage plugins for a lot of different technologies at the moment. Obviously, we're here talking about Limbit today, but we've got uh, Dell PowerFlex, NetApp, uh, SolidFire, Storepool. We, we've got integrations for all of those guys. Now, what happens in our community? We We don't have a solid roadmap of we want to integrate with that vendor, that vendor, that vendor. These integrations are normally vendor or user driven, right? So, so for example, the, the Limbit uh, integration we've got here was completely driven by Philippe and, and his team coming into the community and say, look, we, we want to do this. So it's hard to answer that with a clear, yes, here's the plans, uh, because there isn't a solid roadmap there because it just depends on what vendors come along. But one thing I can answer is there will almost certainly be continuous work on all of those integrations and there will be others appearing at some point. I just can't tell you exactly what they're gonna to be today. And Philip, as we all know, uh, Limbit recently released a technical solution brief on its integration with CloudStack. So we will put the link below in the description of the video. Uh, but would you like to add something? Are you planning on any improvements? Um, what I'm aware is that with the with the creation of our Limbit SDS to to CloudStack integration, um, that triggered some work uh, on Limbit SDS on how we we uh, clone volumes, and and I need to to explain that our stack uh, uses at the bottom end then LVM or CFS. And so that triggered an improvement in our stack that was triggered out, out of the integration with Apache Cloud Stack. So yeah, it's always getting better. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, Giles, for joining me for this interview today. We strongly encourage the Apache Cloud Stack community to check the integration and send feedback to Limbit because that's something which will make the integration even better.